Now, most research papers people are doing, you spend two years on the paper. It's not about current events. In terms of what people think about policy right now, I think there is a little bit of a bias towards thinking whatever your team thinks is good, not maybe even a lot of bit of a bias, and people don't inquire as deeply. So I saw people who looked at the American Rescue Plan, who sort of should have known better, and didn't say, oh, like, how big is it as a share of GDP? How big is the GDP gap? What's the multiplier? They didn't sort of do three steps that they could have done even based on their own research. They went out and said, oh, it's fine. And I think they thought it was fine. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. My guest today is Jason Furman. Jason is a professor of economics at both the economics department at Harvard and at the Harvard Kennedy School. He used to be the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under Barack Obama. We had a conversation in which I basically just pepper Jason with questions that I have about the economy as somebody who's not an economist. Questions about how we ended up in an inflationary spiral, whether we have managed to get out of it, how worried we should be about the slow-moving banking crisis we seem to be in, why it is that economics is an empirical discipline in which your political leanings shouldn't influence what you predict is going to happen, and yet there seem to be quite reliable ways of guessing which side of an empirical debate a left-wing rather than a right-wing economist is going to end up on. And finally, why it is that America, which is in so many obvious ways when it comes to education and infrastructure and other issues, pretty dysfunctional, has managed to keep constant the share of its GDP compared to worldwide GDP, even as pretty impressive countries like Germany and Japan have seen a significant decline in their share of worldwide GDP. Jason, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be with you. I'm trying to understand what's going on with the economy at the moment. And there is a whole ton of questions I have about that. So I hope you can help me make sense of things I don't understand. So let's start with, you know, obviously one of the big questions about the economy in the last few years, which is inflation. Where are we at with that story. So what actually do we understand about what the reasons for this precipitous rise in inflation were? And to what extent do you think it is now under control? Yeah. So first of all, you're looking backward. That's a little bit easier to understand. At some point, we'll try to take glimpses into the future too. Economists like to look at core inflation. They subtract food and energy. That isn't because people don't eat food and use gasoline, but because those things are quite volatile. If you look at the core measure that the Fed uses for inflation, it's basically been running at about a 4.5% rate for two years now. It drifts up a tiny bit every now and then. It drifts down a tiny bit every now and then, but it's incredibly consistent. Underneath that incredibly consistent inflation has been a couple other different stories. In 2021, inflation was in the goods sector. In 2022, it was in the services sector. In 2022, inflation was elevated for headline inflation above core inflation because oil prices went up a lot. In the last several months, oil prices have been coming down And so headline inflation has actually been lower than that core inflation. But it's really been pretty consistent and pretty stubborn. And I think that's important really to understand what the nature of that inflation is. And so what kind of level of inflation should we be aiming for? We're in this sort of strange situation where for a long time we had extremely low inflation. My understanding was that actually economists were somewhat worried about that, but they thought that we had too little inflation in all kinds of ways. And now it feels like we've you know, way overshot the mark and we're sort of above where inflation should be. Now, what are the trade-offs here? I mean, what's the level of in inflation we should aim for? But more importantly, what goes wrong when we have too little inflation? What goes wrong when we have too much inflation? 
Yeah. I mean, that's a harder question to answer than it should be. I mean, one thing that's easy to rule out, by the way, is you don't want a rising inflation rate. You don't want to go four, five, six, seven, twelve, twenty. And, you know, it takes a certain amount of effort to keep it from rising. So that'd be the first thing I'd say. The second thing is you really want a credible, stable inflation rate. Because when inflation moves around, you get arbitrary redistribution. You get people that didn't plan for it. And when expectations are well anchored and predictable, it actually gives the central bank more space to respond to things. If you want to deal with a recession and you're not worried about inflation taking off, you just have much more room to deal with it. So it's a real gift to have it be anchored and stable. Now, there's the question of where do you want it to be anchored and stable at? In one sense, you know, zero. Why should this change? We don't change the yardstick every year. Why should we change the measure of prices every year? Well, there are a few good reasons why modest inflation is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. One is that it lets the economy adjust more easily. Let's say a bad shock happens. Companies can't actually cut their nominal wages. But if there's inflation, that means they can sell their products for more, the real wages fall, and they don't need to cut as many jobs. It also gives the Fed or the central bank more room to stimulate the economy in a recession. What matters for the economy is what real interest rates are, the interest rate minus the inflation rate. A higher inflation rate means lower interest rates. Take all those considerations together. 20 years ago, 2% seemed like the right number based on what we've learned from then. On a blank slate, probably something like 3% would be a better inflation rate to aim for. The question is, if you try to change in midstream from 2 to 3, can you manage that transition? And so for the last year, as you were saying, core inflation has been around 5%. Uh, nominal inflation in some of these years was significantly higher than that. So what caused that? Is that just sort of over weirdness of a pandemic and coming out of a pandemic? And so therefore it's a sort of temporary thing or are there more fundamental factors that have driven inflation up? Yeah, I think there's two broad views on that question. One is what I'd call the series of unfortunate accidents model. And the other is the original sin model. In the series of unfortunate accidents, there just was one thing after the next and each one led to inflation. I think that theory has something to it, but I think it's massively exaggerated. And just to give you a few examples, in the first half of 2021, people were saying the reason we're seeing inflation is that the vaccines are so much more effective than we thought, the economy's reopening incredibly quickly, and so we're getting inflation. Then in the second half of 2021, when we continued to have inflation, the story was, well, it turns out the vaccines aren't as good as we thought. Delta and Omicron are shutting down the economy, and because of that, we're getting inflation. Now, it's possible both those stories are true, but I think it's quite hard to reconcile them. And in my view, the first story actually was correct. The vaccines probably did fuel inflation. I think Delta and Omicron actually lowered inflation, especially in the services sector, and delayed it. Another unfortunate accident is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which really did raise oil and food prices. It had a huge impact in Europe. It had some impact in the United States, but most of that impact was on headline inflation. If you look at core inflation, there was relatively little pass-through of the food and energy prices into everything else. You know, other accidents people cite are things like problems at the port, problems with microchips, but you look at those and it turns out they look more like demand than they do supply. I mean, ports were processing tons of stuff in 2021. It just wasn't as much as Americans wanted to buy from the rest of the world because they want to buy a huge amount. But the problem was not that the ports got worse. It was that people wanted more. So there is something to the series of unfortunate accidents, but I think, frankly, it's quite small, quite exaggerated. Yeah, so what is the original sin model? If a series of unfortunate accidents may have played some role but isn't ultimately convincing, give us the Catholic explanation instead. Just a huge amount of demand. And I should say original sins. There were two of them. One is just a massive fiscal policy. We spent you know, 10% of GDP per year for basically two and a half years in a row. That's the most that's ever been spent outside of World War II. 
it's almost impossible to imagine you could do that without getting a big expansion. Now, I say we, the United States, if you look at Europe and Japan, you actually see similar levels of fiscal policy, a lot of it happening more through things like credit and forbearance on loans in the case of Europe than through direct spending. And then monetary policy didn't adjust. You have this extraordinary thing where in the United States at the beginning of 2022, you had an inflation rate above 5%. You had an unemployment rate below 4%. So you're below what the Fed thinks the natural rate is. You're way above where they want to be on inflation, and interest rates are still zero. So it's that huge amount of demand. Now, where we are now is partly that demand is still high, but even more that I think we're in a self-perpetuating, some people call it you know, a wage price spiral. I try to avoid that word. I call it wage price persistence, where if wages are going to go up, by five, then prices will go up by five, wages will go up by five, prices will go up by five, and you get stuck in a certain place, although a wedge between those numbers due to productivity, but you know, broadly speaking, stuck in something like that. So are we stuck at the moment? Clearly inflation has come down somewhat over the last 12 months, but we're also above that 3% that you posited as sort of where we probably want to be a few minutes ago. So you know, are we sort of going to continue to be above that 3%? Do you think that we're moving slowly back towards the 3%? You know, I know that the economists have predicted 17 out of the last three recessions. And in general, one should not ask members of your profession to make any predictions. But I trust you more than the average economists. So try and predict the next inflationary spiral for me. Thanks so much for your trust, Yasha. And and look, I mean, one thing economists need to do is be honest about their standard errors. If you look at the survey of professional forecasters in May of 2021, they said there was less than a 1% chance that inflation would exceed 4%. And it ended up way above 5%. So I think you do need to acknowledge there's a huge amount of uncertainty right now. When we talk about policy, You know, you have to think, what if I'm wrong in this direction? How bad are the consequences of that? What if I'm wrong in that direction? How bad are the consequences weighing them? You don't just want to make policy based on your central best guess. In terms of a central best guess, the equation economists use to organize their thinking is that inflation is a function of three things. One is sometimes called expectations, but you should think of that just as the internal dynamics of inflation, that wages lead to prices, prices lead to wages. If you think everyone else is going to raise prices, you're going to raise your prices, et cetera. It's sort of the self-fulfilling thing is one term. The second term is how tight the economy is, how much demand there is, often simplified by how low the unemployment rate is. And the third term is what supply shocks are like. Let's take those in reverse order. On the supply shocks, right now, those seem to basically be zero. In fact, if anything, there might be a little bit favorable. Inflation is temporarily a little bit lower because energy prices have been falling. And so I don't expect much action on the supply side, you know, other than unpredictable things, you know, war in the Middle East, whatever, you'll have something on the supply side. Then there's that demand term, labor market tightness term. And there we see the unemployment rate quite low. Job openings have come down, but are still higher than any time they were before the pandemic. And so the labor market on balance looks as or more tight than it was in 2019. And so that suggests some continued upward pressure. And then finally, there's that self-sustaining dynamic, and that's the hardest one to understand because it's based on perceptions, the policy regime, and the like. Historically, inflation went back to too quickly. Now it looks like there's more momentum built into it that could keep it away from there for a while. Help me understand the situation of the labor market because that's important in a broader sense as well. I mean, the first thing to say, of course, is that It seems like great news if there's a lot of demand for labor and as a result, people can command higher wages. There's finally some real growth in wages for low-income workers. That all sounds great. But my understanding is that when you look at those numbers a little bit more closely in this weird situation where the labor market is incredibly tight, but the number of Americans who are in the labor force actually continues to be quite low and is at least still lower than it was before the pandemic. So, you know, is this people who 
have gotten used to not working for part of a pandemic and they don't want to enter the labor force? Is this part of Angus Deaton's and Anne Case's story of sort of deaths of despair and the huge number of people who are on disability and, you know, who are addicted to painkillers and so on? Is this less migration because of the pandemic? You know, what's going on here where on the one hand, you know, businesses are desperately seeking workers and on the other hand, it seems like a lot of Americans are continuing to be outside of a labor market. So premise your question is a little bit right and a little bit outdated. So let me do both parts of that. Look at what the Congressional Budget Office forecast in January 2020, when they had no idea the pandemic was going to disrupt the economy. In fact, it was a forecast they had locked earlier, probably in December of the previous year. So their pre-pandemic forecast. Look at what they said jobs would be in this time in 2023. And we actually have jobs above where they expected it to be. And the labor force participation rate almost exactly where they expected it to be. So if you were sort of Rip Van Winkle, you had the data through 2019, you went to sleep, you woke up, you looked around, you wouldn't be that surprised about jobs. And so the labor force story was a story that was true a year ago but it actually has repaired itself. Now, you can look at it from different angles and argue it's a little bit below what you thought, a little bit above what you thought, but I think broadly speaking, there is no mystery of the missing workers. Now, the respect in which you're correct is the forecast that CBO made, that's the Congressional Budget Office, trusted forecasters, that they made in January 2020, in some sense embodied a certain pessimism. Now, some of it is just demographics. The population was going to age, so they expected the labor force to decline. But we also have men withdrawing from the workforce for 70 years now. You have women who have been sort of roughly flat or down for about 20 years now. And so I do think we have a labor force participation issue in the U.S. economy, but it's less of a temporary pandemic problem, which has mostly been solved, and more of a long-term problem which is still with us. In terms of what the issue in the labor market is, in one sense, it's amazing and wonderful. It's hard to look at the last employment report where you saw the black unemployment rate was the lowest it ever had been and not think this is anything other than amazing. The issue is a worry that, you know, it may not be sustainable. And the place economists have looked a lot is job openings being really high and the sort of soft landing thing that people are rooting for is that job openings come down without the unemployment rate going up. And if that happens, maybe the economy could cool without a lot of additional unemployment. You were saying that in 2021, very few economists had a sense of inflation going up. And presumably that is an anonymous survey in which people are giving the real views. I also had a sense that, you know, perhaps a year or so later, you'll know the timing better than I there was starting to be a sense among a good number of economists that inflation seemed to be going up. The signs that we were about to be in this inflationary crisis were becoming a lot more obvious. And yet, my sense is that there was real reluctance among a lot of left of center economists to talk about this in a proactive way, because it seemed politically inopportune. It seemed that worries about inflation might scupper parts of Joe Biden's agenda, which they supported for good reason. It seemed as though it might perhaps allow Republicans to have talking points about, you know, Democrats being engaged in profligate spending, even though that wasn't really the origin of the pandemic, since after all, Republicans were in charge for a lot of the time when we decided to spend a lot of money on pandemic relief, as was probably necessary. To what extent do you think that these political considerations held economists back and Did that make it harder for the administration to actually respond to inflation in a effective and proactive manner? I don't know exactly. Initially, when you looked at the initial fiscal plan that President Biden did, the American Rescue Plan, a very conservative economist, Doug holtz Eakin, said he thought it was a terrible, awful, horrible plan that was a huge waste of money oh, but by the way, it will not raise inflation because, you know, inflation is just very unresponsive and stuck it too. So, you know, even conservative economists, that wasn't the objection they had to it was inflation. They were making other ones. Over the course of 2021, you know, financial markets were also betting 
on low inflation. And that's definitely anonymous. You're betting with your money on it. So it was a bit of a collective error. But I think it would be fair to say that you had especially progressive economists doing a certain amount of cheerleading. At first, there is no inflation then you know the inflation's going to go away then the inflation's not so bad as long as you're not buying a used car and you know then eventually it's not so bad as long as you're not buying anything at which point you know i think there was a shift to feeling your pain acknowledging it that's actually when you got the greed narrative the greed narrative on the left i interpreted as we're not going to try to argue that there is no inflation or inflation is not a problem we're just going to try to have another villain for that inflation and another solution to that inflation than the mainstream one. No, I don't think you'd do your side any favors if you're engaged in wishful thinking and being honest and talking about trade-offs and saying hard truths. I think that's always better. Now, this isn't a truth. It's a guess. There's different guesses and honest people could disagree. But yeah, I think you want to try to be unbiased in that thinking. There's this amazing line from his minister, which applies to politics in so many different ways. I mean, you know, the world of his minister is a very instinctively conservative world and a very institutionalist world and applies in that world, but it can also apply to, you know, cheerleading progressive economists. I'm sure it applies to cheerleading conservative economists when there's a Republican president. And it's something like, I'm going to fail to do the exact steps. Perhaps uh, as somebody who's more politically seasoned than I am, you can supply the rest of them. But it's something like, you know, at first you deny that there is a problem. Then you say that there's nothing we can do about it. Then you say, perhaps there's something that we could have done about it, but it's too late now. And there's sort of a couple of steps in between, right? <laughs> but how, as a economist, do you balance between, you know, having values and advocating for ideas and policies, which you think are going to make the world better, and therefore always having the temptation to describe the world in a particular kind of way that is conformable with you know, your deep convictions about how the world works and what kind of thing would make it better, but trying to make sure that you don't fall into that kind of wishful thinking. I think this is a problem that social scientists across the board face, people writing about politics face. I'm always struck by the extent to which very few people have a divergence in who they think should win the primaries because they're most electable and who they think should win the primaries because they happen to agree with a program. It just so happens that everybody always thinks that the candidate whom they prefer on substantive grounds is also the candidate who's more likely to beat the opponent in the general election, right? How do we, particularly in economics, check that instinct towards wishful thinking? Because I think that's something that you've done repeatedly in your career, arguing that, you know, a position to which you're sympathetic is not going to work well, or, or that there's economic realities which make it hard to pursue something you would otherwise want to do? How do we go about avoiding falling into that trap? Yeah, look, it's hard. And it depends on the topic. I mean, I teach the introductory economics class here at Harvard Act 10. We teach students the distinction between positive and normative. I'm sure you have a more nuanced understanding than the way we teach it. But as an aspirational goal, I think it's a good one. You know, if you're debating what the top tax rate should be, and I'm debating it with a conservative economist friend, they might think people's behavior is going to respond more. You know, a high tax rate will discourage more work. I might be a little bit less worried about that. But our behavioral assumptions are not going to be that different. I'm going to acknowledge it's going to affect behavior and have a downside. And my estimate of that isn't going to be so different. My values are going to be quite different. I'm going to think, you know, they won't miss the money and someone else could use the money and they'll think they worked hard. They deserve the money. It's unfair to take it from them. And so it really, on an issue like that, comes down to values. Monetary policy and these macro issues are much more about a positive debate than they are about a normative debate. But unfortunately, that positive debate often masquerades as a normative debate. So just to give you an example, if I tell you wages are going to grow 6% a year for the next five years, then what do you think inflation will be? Well, one view is, you know what? There's no reason the businesses can't absorb those wage increases. They can just lower their profits. They don't need to pass them on to their customers. And so there's no reason why we can't have 2% inflation. Everything I just said, I wish is true. 
I would be incredibly happy if you could have 6% wage growth and 2% price growth. But you can't confuse the team you're rooting for, team workers in this case, with the team you expect to win the game. And if you tell me wages are going to go up 6% a year for the next five years, I'm going to tell you I think prices are going to go up about 5% a year for the next five years. And the difference is productivity allows you to do some of the wage increases without raising prices. And so there's sort of this distinction between the team you're rooting for and on the team you want to win. Same thing with inflation forecasting. There's nothing normative about it. You know, you have a forecast. Inflation either is that or isn't that. It doesn't really care about what your feelings are about the economy, what's nice and what's not nice. And if you systematically are basing your views on a prediction of the inflation rate, and the inflation rate keeps being higher than you think, it wasn't that you cared more about workers. It's that you were wrong and you were giving bad advice. And so, you know, this mortal combat of like low inflation forecast means you like workers. No, it doesn't. Over the last two years, it just means you were bad at understanding what was going on or maybe unlucky with unfortunate events that got in the way. But either way, it doesn't mean that you liked workers more than the person who was forecasting higher inflation. So I agree with you that at the theoretical level, this is pretty straightforward. The distinction between normative and empirical really is not that complicated in most practical realms. There's some interesting philosophical questions around it and, you know, very particular kinds of cases, but it really shouldn't be that hard. Empirically, though, it does seem to be quite hard. I mean, I have become quite disheartened by the fact that in the areas of social science that I know best, I can usually predict what the consensus in the literature is going to be based on some broad, you know, understanding of where political priorities lie and what kind of findings are more conformable to the broad worldview of the people who dominate in the social sciences. And sometimes there's going to be a few cranky academics who disagree with that consensus. And they're quite reliably going to be people who don't necessarily come from the same political leaning. And so perhaps in economics, which is a more ideologically diverse discipline than some other social sciences and humanities disciplines, is not quite as bad. But, you know, I find that certainly among the most visible economists, you know, it's quite predictable on the most important issues that very distinguished economists who are left-leaning are going to have empirical descriptions of a world that happen to be pretty conformable with the political priorities of the Democratic Party or the left, and, you know, very prominent economists who are conservative in political leaning are going to line up with empirical descriptions of a world that just so happen to be much more useful and much more politically comfortable for people who are, you know, Republican politicians, for example. So have I become too cynical about this? Or if you really go to the American Economic Association conference and you really look at the debates in most distinguished journals, do you find that those kind of priors are not as helpful at predicting what people are going to be saying? Or is it the case that even in those kind of fora, you can kind of guess where Paul Krugman is going to be and you can kind of guess where Greg Mankiw is going to be on empirical questions on which the normative leanings shouldn't, in theory, allow me to make that kind of prediction? Yeah. So let's distinguish between three different things. The research that economists do the views they have on public policy and the views they express on public policy. In terms of the research, I don't think it's perfect. There are days when I'm troubled by the political bias, and frankly, that political bias is mostly left. Almost everyone under the age of 50 who does research, especially in certain areas like empirical micro, is left of center. There are days I'm worried about that, but I go to seminars and, you know, someone presents a paper and maybe it has a left conclusion and the faculty in the room are less interested in cheerleading the left conclusion and more interested in proving how smart they are by poking holes in the empirical method, the theory or whatever it is. And there's also a return to research that has contrarian findings. And there's a lot of researchers I know who do their research, not because they know the answer and want to prove it to everyone, but because they don't know the answer and want to figure it out. And they love to be surprised. And I could give you a lot of examples of that. So I don't think the research is perfect. I think all the pressure is in one direction, not the other direction. But there are some counter pressures.
Now let's talk about public policy. Now, most research papers people are doing, you spend two years on the paper. It's not about current events. In terms of what people think about policy right now, I think there is a little bit of a bias towards thinking whatever your team thinks is good, and not maybe even a lot of bit of a bias, and people don't inquire as deeply. So I saw people who looked at the American Rescue Plan, they sort of should have known better, and didn't say, oh, like, how big is it as a share of GDP? How big is the GDP gap? What's the multiplier? They didn't sort of do three steps that they could have done even based on their own research. They went out and said, oh, it's fine, and I think they thought it was fine. Then there's a last problem, which I think really, really is a big one, which is not what people think, but what they say. I soft-pedaled my criticisms of the American Rescue Plan because of reasons I regret, not really understanding how to fully conduct myself in a world where a Democrat was in power and people cared about my views, which is something I'd never experienced before outside of government. And I think I made a mistake. I had a lot of friends texting me, this is too large, but I don't want to say it. During the student loan thing, I was a little bit outspoken on thinking it was a problem. I had people texting me, I'm really glad you're saying that. I just don't want to say that myself because I'll get killed. Now, that doesn't mean those things are hidden truths. The people texting me might have been wrong about either one of those issues. But it does mean there are a set of views on one side of a topic that people whisper in private and a set of views on the other side that they shout out loud. And so the aggregation process itself is biased. So I think you get some bias at the research level, some bias at the public policy thinking level, some bias at what gets expressed. And I agree with you, that all compounds. I'll just do a very brief coda. Greg Mankiw, I didn't know he was a Republican when he was my advisor, because his research really was something you couldn't quite predict. And he came out last year and said he thought the Fed was acting too aggressively and too hawkishly and they should slow down. Um, I think he was wrong. I disagreed with him at the time. But that was not a predictable view in his case. Yeah, I mean, one interesting element of this is that the basic mechanisms of virality in social media apply to academic research findings as much as they do to anything else, right? So I'm struck in some of the fields that I know well that, you know, when there's 10 paper on an issue, and as you're saying, you know, the thing that economics are most interested in is proving that they're smart. And one great way of proving that they're smart is to, you know, write an effective takedown of something that everybody else is doing. Often there's, you know, two papers that find one kind of thing strongly and two papers that find one the opposite strongly and six papers that sit somewhere in the middle, right? But even within academic circles, when one of these findings is much more conformable to an overall worldview or to an overall picture one is tempted to paint of a world, it can be the case that those two papers are cited much, much, much more than the other eight papers put together, and that, you know, anybody who's sort of half a step away from being, uh, you know, a super expert who really is focused on this very particular question will have a sense that, you know, there's a consensus in the literature that we found X, even though that's two out of 10 papers that go around, make the rounds, not just on Twitter and not just in the New York Times, but even within academic circles, because they fit in a sort of broader worldview. Yeah, and let me give you an example of that. Gabriel Zuckman just won the John Bates Clark Medal for the best economist under the age of 40. He's a brilliant researcher. He published in a top economics journal, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, a paper on measuring inequality, a number of papers on measuring inequality that were really landmark papers in terms of methodology, concept, the way this was done. But I think it would be fair to say that every time he and his other researchers that he worked with had a choice, they made a choice that made it look like inequality was higher rather than inequality was lower. Other researchers have since come along, used some of the same methods, but adjusted some of those assumptions in ways that might be, I think, more realistic and more accurate. They show less of an increase in inequality, but they wouldn't be published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And not because they reach a less liberal conclusion, but just 
They're the second paper. They're a bit of a cleanup. They're tweaking some parameters in an existing model. There's nothing very exciting about that, even though they might actually be more true than what the original one was. So that's what happens in the journals. And then, of course, in the press, you know, people like those findings more and report them more. You know, one other example of this is political science, although economists got involved, was there was that paper that went really viral in the media that showed that every time Donald Trump held a rally, violence and crime in the area, I can't remember what form of crime, increased in the wake of it. Might have been hate crime, might have been, you know, crime in general. Grad students in economics here at Harvard went and reproduced that, but instead of Donald Trump rallies, they did Hillary Clinton rallies or Hillary Clinton events. And they had the exact same finding, the exact same increases in hate crime or crime or whatever it was. And it turned out what was driving this was it was a period in which I think crime was rising. I don't remember exactly. And these were large urban areas that these were happening in. And there were a lot of people. It had nothing to do with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. It was just the methodology spuriously produced this finding. Anyway, I don't think that second paper got one one one-hundredth of the attention that the first one did because the second one said, you know what, there's nothing to see here. The first one said there's something really congenial to all of us um, to see here, and and that's a problem, and I don't exactly know how to fix that. Yeah, one of the most interesting examples of that to me in political science is the fact that for many years political scientists have been using... Uh, in a standard way, the sort of racial resentment scale, which is necessary because the original questions that social scientists use to measure racism, thankfully, don't result in a lot of variation anymore. So when you ask people, you know, do you hate black people? You know, thankfully, most people say no. And so therefore, it's not a very helpful metric. And so people are thinking, okay, well, perhaps in order to get at some form of racist sentiments, we have to have these more indirect questions about racial resentment. But the kind of questions they've fastened upon are often just sort of questions that effectively measure how you feel about Republican Party policies, right? They're asking things like, Italians and Irish immigrants succeeded in the country without having any form of special assistance. Do you think the same should be true of African Americans? Now, you know, you might have strong views about that, but that just looks like pretty much asking about whether you're a Democrat or Republican. And so it's unsurprising that people who score higher on the quote-unquote racial resentment scale are also much more likely to vote for Republican candidates like Donald Trump. And so all of the you know, studies have been written up in the New York Times are saying racism causes people to vote for Donald Trump or racists are more likely to vote for Donald Trump. When really you've asked them whether they agree with a Republican Party policy position and then conclude from that fact that, lo and behold, they're more likely to vote for Donald Trump. There was a very interesting paper by some political scientists at Harvard, actually, who used the racial resentment scale and asked people some of the same questions, applied it to some of the same kinds of empirical conclusions. But instead of African-Americans, they asked about Estonians, which is a group that, you know, Americans do not traditionally have a particular reason to be hostile towards. So it's not a big fault line in American politics. You wouldn't expect a lot of people to have deep resentment against Estonians. And yet it turns out that a lot of the findings that the racial resentment scale claims to come to about African-Americans, absurdly, it also comes to about Estonians. So I think it's a pretty good reductio ad absurdum of the utility of the racial resentment scale. It shows some real problems with it. But of course, the field has gone right on using the scale. It hasn't really resulted in even serious political scientists desisting from using a scale that in my mind has been, you know, very significantly undermined, if not debunked, by this very clever test. That was not one I had followed. That was interesting. I mean, political science is something interestingly different about it than economics, which is with rare exceptions of which you're one. People aren't that interested in the views of political scientists. People can write their story about what happens in Congress without calling a political scientist. Usually, if they're writing their story about what the Fed did, they call an economist, almost always. And political science work, there's less that I see is directly policy recommendations. It's more analysis. And so in some sense, I don't know if maybe this is too insulting to a discipline, but sometimes I look at disciplines and say, like, no one actually cares what you think, so you might as well just think the truth. I mean, this was true, by the way, one that I was reading about recently, 
30 years ago, there was a big debate among chimpanzee researchers as to whether chimpanzees were a docile, happy species or a warlike species and whether there was such a thing as chimpanzee murder. And there were a group of people who thought, you know, if you admitted that chimpanzees engaged in murder, it would legitimize human murder and human war and it would make the world a worse place. And I sort of feel like yelling at those anthropologists no one who is deciding whether to invade another country, Putin does not care about your research about whether chimpanzees engage in murder. Whatever you find about chimpanzees, whether they do or don't engage in murder, will have zero impact on whether there are wars. So it's an interesting scientific question. Why don't you just figure out the scientific truth and not try to think there's something bigger at stake? And, you know, political scientists are more relevant than chimpanzee researchers, but not that much more. And economists are only probably slightly more relevant than political scientists. So, yeah, why not just figure out this incredibly interesting puzzles about how the world works? This is an unlikely segue, but I recently had Franz de Waal on the podcast and we discussed some of those questions. So anybody interested, you should go and listen back to the conversation with one of the prime chimpanzee researchers who did, I think, come up with the idea of the alpha male, who on his description is not just a sort of macho guy, but has some positive characteristics as well. And it's a kind of complicated story. And when I think Newt Gingrich picked up that book in the 90s and assigned it to all of the freshman Republican to read about, you know, how they should be acting in Congress. So, you know, sometimes the chimpanzee researcher can have an unlikely influence. Well, I mean, I think it has an unlikely influence. And frankly, there's an awful lot of economics this way, which is Newt Gingrich thought what he thought, found a book to echo it. Not that uh, he read the book and was persuaded. I think that's right, right? I mean, this is one of the fundamental problems certainly of intellectuals, but also just of politicians, that can you affect and influence the world, probably in some kind of way? Would you affect and influence it in the way you set out to? Who knows? I mean, you know, it might be that the policy you fight for gets passed and has really unfortunate, unforeseen consequences. Or it may be that it's passed and has wonderful consequences, but there's also some kind of reaction against it you weren't expecting, or it spurs somebody else into action, and as a result, things get much worse because of sort of the way it allows other people to act. I mean, in some ways, I've thought about this about Barack Obama, who's a man who I you know, deeply admire. And if anybody has had you know a real impact on American politics in the last 25 or 30 years, he is the most likely candidate. But there is a very plausible story that Donald Trump would never have become president if it hadn't been for Barack Obama. I think a little bit of that, it's not as obvious as some people are saying, this idea that Trump is just the sort of reaction of angry people at the idea that we had a black president. I'm not quite sure, but explains why Obama carried Ohio and Michigan and so on, and Democrats he's being able to carry those states. I think the story is a little bit more complicated than that. But it's not unimaginable, let's say, that if Obama had lost to Romney in 2012, America would probably be a better place, not because I prefer Romney to Obama, but before I strongly prefer Romney to Trump. So the sort of long-term consequences of what you do are really complicated. And at the same time, there's a piece to the story where it's not just political scientists, but everybody overestimates the importance of what they do for the simple reason that it's really hard to come to the basic insight that, for the most part, you don't matter, right? For the most part, we all don't matter. I mean, I think about this with journalists, right? There's a lot of pressure in journalism about how do you frame a story? How do you describe a story? Do you tell a story or not? What words do you use in that story? And when it comes to the rise in violent crime over the last couple of years, for example, right, there, there sort of seemed to be this assumption among many, many journalists and some of my friends and colleagues, you know, at the New York Times and at the Washington Post and at the Atlantic, you know, the way that we frame what's going on with crime in America is going to determine the policy response and it's going to determine whether or not people are going to be tempted to vote for Donald Trump in 2024. But that hugely overestimates what the role of those publications in the world is today. And I think it underestimates the average voter. The average voter has some sense of what's going on in the world and the idea that, you know, they're not going to see the world as they do because you've so cleverly framed it for them. And so therefore you've saved them from coming to the quote unquote wrong conclusion is just a huge overestimation of your own role and agency in the world. Yeah. And look, to some degree, I think you do need to think, I'm going to act as if somebody's going to care. 
I'd like to think that there are some people involved in the Fed that will care sometimes about what I think about macro. It'll have an influence. I'd like to think that what I think is going to make the world a better place. And as a result, it's worth my time. And you know, some of that may be delusional. Some of it may be not. There are times when the political system is fighting about something. And I know I'm not going to change anyone's mind, but maybe I have a good argument for one side and I agree with that side. So you know, I'll weigh in. Sometimes I think it can be fruitful to try to shape thinking on topics before people have thought very much about them. You know, if you were working on the best way to expand the earned income tax credit in the late 1990s, as I was and other people were, like, you know, that wasn't that political an issue at the time. And if people were going to do it, like, were you going to change the formula this way, change the formula that way? They didn't mind listening to an economist. I think there are different ways. But I do think people need to be better at thinking about sort of what they can control and what they can't. So Christina Paxson, the president of Brown, recently had an op-ed in the New York Times in which she argued the bigger threats to academic freedom are coming in places like Florida, where Governor DeSantis is using the power of the state to suppress speech. I thought that was a pretty good op-ed. I mostly agreed with everything she said in that op-ed. But it is also the case that she has very, very little influence over Governor DeSantis. For all I know is he'll do even worse things to upset her and the other liberals who publish in the New York Times. And she has a lot of influence over Brown, which she's president of, and in the sort of Northeast Ivies. And here the problem is not that the state is getting in our way and pushing a right-wing agenda, if anything, is the opposite. And so, you know, I sometimes think, you know, climate scientists, same thing. They're not trusted as much as they should be from the public. The best way for them to gain the public's trust is not to complain about how ignorant the public is, but to be really, really better at patrolling their own political statements and the own ways in which they give the public an excuse not to trust them. Now, if they behaved impeccably, would there still be too little trust? Yeah, there probably would be. But lamenting it and complaining about it doesn't do anything. Patrolling yourself is, I think, the only way forward on these sorts of things. One other thing I've been hoping to understand, Jason, is, you know, what's going on with the banks? Why is it that we seem to be in this slow-moving financial crisis? Is this a sort of inevitable impact of unexpectedly rising inflation? Or is this bad bank governance where they simply did not imagine that something uh, outside the very recent models, but that is hardly a historically unprecedented event, might completely screw them over. And so we didn't prepare for that. And how worried do we need to be about it? Is this something that's well under control of the Treasury? Or is there potential here for a slow motion return to something like the 2008 financial crisis? Yeah. So, no one knows the answer to those questions. I'll, like everything else, do the best I can. First of all, if this was 2019 and you told me we're going to have a pandemic, a biggest inflation in 40 years, biggest increase in interest rates in 40 years, I might have predicted worse damage in the financial system than what we've seen. So I really do think the reforms that were put in place in Dodd-Frank, they're not perfect. We're seeing some of their imperfections now but they put us in a much better place where we had all sorts of economic problems, but we didn't have anything resembling a financial crisis. It's always been the case that there are some banks that are badly managed. They fail. And in some sense, First Republic is sort of how it should work, which is your bank fails. You go out and get the best deal you can. You sell it to another bank and everyone is safe and whole and the world moves on. And the three big bank failures we've seen in the United States and the one big failure in Switzerland really were outlier, badly managed institutions. So I think that's a lot of what's happened so far. In terms of where we are right now, on paper, the banking system has $2.2 trillion cushion of capital. But a lot of that is missing two big accounting pieces. One subtracts from it, which is the value of its assets are lower than they were before, and they don't fully mark that to market. But the other goes in the other direction, which is the value of what's called their deposit franchise goes up, which is they're an institution that can make money at a higher interest rate and collect deposits at a much lower interest rate. And the gap between those goes up 
when interest rates go up. It's better to be a bank if you can pay your depositors 1% in a world of 5% interest rates than in a world of 3% interest rates. And so I think the banking system as a whole is now mostly fine in the short run. The two different factors are moving in different directions. The really terribly managed banks have been weeded out. But over a five-year horizon, I don't think a lot of the regional banks in the United States have a viable business model. Basically, they were premised on hoping depositors wouldn't notice that they were getting ripped off. And maybe you could do that in the past. But in a world of prolonged higher interest rates and lots of liquid electronic options for your money, that's harder to do. So I think we're going to need to see a change in business models. We're going to need to see consolidation. I don't think we should be squeamish about large banks if they're more efficient acquiring small banks. But there's no reason this needs to play out like the 2008 crisis. Um, And then the last thing I'd say is Dodd-Frank was very good, but the last crisis was all about credit risk and illiquidity. You had a mortgage. The mortgage wasn't paying you back. You couldn't sell it. It pushed banks into bonds because those have no credit risk, we hope, and they're very liquid. Well, it turns out they have another set of risks, interest rate risk. And so I do think the regulations need to be tweaked to basically add this third risk to the two that they already did a pretty good job of handling. I have a really broad economic puzzle that I want to... Oh, we're back to economics. Well, we've been talking in a way about economics over time. But here's a question, right? I mean, I grew up in Germany and I always tend to be a Germany critic. I think the country is not as perfect and efficient and so on as people outside it often think. But, you know, it is in many ways a very impressive country in terms of how things work, in terms of its infrastructure, in terms of its social cohesion, in terms of its political functionality, actually. You, know, you go to Japan, it is an incredibly impressive society, right, with a train system which connects, you know, the major cities to each other with incredible speed regularity and reliability with also very strong social cohesion, very high levels of education, students who work incredibly hard. Even countries that we think of as quite dysfunctional, like France, are actually very impressive in all kinds of ways. And then you go to the United States, and in so many ways, the country seems dysfunctional, right? I mean, the crime rate is way higher than it is in Japan or in Germany. Trains really only exist in a few regions like the Acela Corridor in any kind of regularity and so on. And there they are, you know, much less fast, much more often delayed. The share of Americans who have a deeply substandard school education, who go to school in dilapidated buildings, in schools where they have to worry about real violence, where they don't achieve, you know, basic literacy and numeracy. The share of Americans who that's true is just much higher. And so it'd be very tempting to tell this deeply declining story about America. And yet the striking fact is that America's share of world GDP, and you may tell me again that I'm getting the premise of this question wrong, but... No, no, I'm going to agree with your premise. Yeah, go on. Yeah, it has actually stayed constant over the last 25 or 30 years, whereas Japan's share of world GDP and Germany's share of world GDP has declined quite significantly. So help me make sense of this puzzle. How is it that America, a society which in so many obvious ways is not working, is so lacking in social cohesion, has such problems of infrastructure, actually, such weaknesses in mass education, nevertheless is outperforming those other countries that seem so impressive from the outside on economic terms? Yeah, I read John Kenneth Galbraith's The Affluent Society 35 years ago. He wrote it well before I read it. And he began with this contrast between what it looked like in an American house and what it looked like in an American public space. I think it might have been an airport, but I don't remember exactly. And so, you know, go to a house in Japan. It's really small compared to what people in America are living in. 
it has less likely to have like a washer dryer. At least that's certainly true in Europe. I'm not positive if that's the case in Japan. The internal, you know, centralized heating and air conditioning, the stuff that the people have, et cetera. And there's a set of private living standards that are much higher in the United States than they are in most of the other advanced economies. But that does really coexist with a lack of adequate investment or of adequately well-managed investment in a lot of the public domain. And is that that Americans have different tastes than people in other countries? Is it something about the way the rules of our political system um, that were set up? Is it it's something else? I don't I actually don't know exactly what it is. Now, I wouldn't sort of diminish all of those private material things like, oh, that's all, you know, materialist. We shouldn't care about it. People care about that. People care a lot about that. And in almost every one of those metrics, people are much, much better off than they were in the past. But yeah, no, I lament the state of the rail travel in the United States the state of schools and all sorts of other things. And I should say, by the way, everything I said was about sort of 85% of Americans. There's poverty in America is too high. It's hard to know exactly how to compare it to poverty in Europe, but it feels worse to me. I'm not positive that's right. And different data gives you different answers. My guess is it's not as bad as what you have in Japan. So that gives me a sense of the sort of overall comparison and how to think about it. And certainly as somebody who grew up middle class in Europe, but is now middle class in the United States, you know, I think Americans really aren't aware how much they take for granted from the size of housing in the United States to the regularity of which people eat out to the ease with which they avail themselves of all kinds of services. There is still you know, a very real difference in the kind of way in which, especially an American who enjoys the college premium, a college-educated American lives and what they take for granted in terms of uh, how they spend money compared to a peer in an equivalent walk of life in the United States. It's extreme when it comes to professions like lawyers and doctors, which just make you know, vastly more money in the United States than they do, certainly in continental Europe. But it's true up and down the income scale. In fact, one of the things that I always find interesting is that actually the average teacher in the United States makes a lot more money than the average teacher in Europe. The difference in income between a lawyer and a teacher in the United States is much bigger than it is in other countries. And, and that's a real problem if you want to have a certain kind of social standing, a certain kind of social respect, and if you want to attract talented people to the profession and so on. But in terms of sort of raw living standard, what uh, certainly a, a teacher with tenure in most public school systems in the United States makes is a lot more than they would in just about anywhere in the European Union. So I agree with sort of a comparison of actually America's deep affluence. But I guess I was trying to understand what the reason for that is. I mean, why is it that over the last 30 years, America's economy has kept up with average growth around the world, despite the very rapid progress of, you know, countries like China and India and so on, which made it hard to keep relative GDP in line with what it was. And these European countries did not. Is that just a story about tech and the fact that Google and Apple and Amazon are located in the United States? Is that a story about America's excellence at the highest level of education, about, you know, the Harvards and the Stanfords and, and so on? Is that a story about less business regulation and the ease of starting businesses and entrepreneurial spirit? I mean, what is it that allowed America to keep its, its share of GDP when countries like Germany and Japan didn't? Yeah. So, Yasha, I just wish I had a good answer for you. I was just racking my brain for even what academic papers I've seen that have even asked this question. And none of them are leaping to mind. So I'm tempted to say anything I like about America and dislike about Europe is the cause of whatever it is you just said and so fit it into my narrative. Certainly when I speak to European economists, you know, they want to understand a lot of the things you just said. How did we foster ecosystems like Silicon Valley? You know, Europe is very dependent on bank financing and has underdeveloped capital markets that can do other forms of financing. The venture industry is bigger than the United States. There's sort of a lot of how do you have all of that? How can we reproduce that? But 
I don't know that that adds up to the difference between the two. I'd also be interested in comparing like a range of industries across the two. So I don't know. And, you know, there's somebody that probably could give you a better answer than I could, but I don't think there's anyone that could give you a sort of quantified out, fully satisfying answer to your question based on the state of knowledge right now. Well, perhaps you can get a few PhD students on the question and I'll happily have them on the podcast and listen to the answers once they come up with it. What are some big things that America and perhaps, you know, Japan and perhaps countries in Europe could do to boost living standards for ordinary people? Is there any low hanging fruit where if only we could get the political will or if only we could get the smart decisions? we could really have a positive impact on how most people live? Or is there no such low-hanging fruit? First of all, what you can do to increase overall growth, which especially if you can do that without increasing inequality, is quite important. I, by the way, am bullish on chat GPT and these types of learning models because I think our problem over the last 50 years hasn't been robots taking too many jobs, but robots not taking enough jobs away. And the other way to phrase that more politely is we just haven't had enough productivity growth. And if we could have more productivity growth, that matters. And and I worry, I look at some European countries and their hostility to this technology and think they're really risking on missing out from, I think, the biggest wild card that could actually raise GDP growth. My guess is not you know, in some transformational, massive, insane amount. But, you know, over time, as you figure out different ways to deploy it in different areas. So one is just don't mess stuff up like that. Um, Two is have more basic research um, into areas that will get you more things like that and many other things in the economy. So there's the productivity side of things. Then there's the more shared growth. And, you know, things like education, I think the minimum wage could go up in the United States etc., less so elsewhere. And finally, you say, you know what? We're just not going to get the distribution we want from the economy, so let's run a really efficient, well-organized market economy and tax the people who are lucky or skilled, do well in it, and give more money to the others. And certainly in the United States, for example, giving money to households with low-income children is, I mean, maybe not a no-brainer, but about as close to a no-brainer as I think you can get. So... That was a incomplete answer, but generally my view is this is a really big question you asked, and you want an all of the above response to it, not a like don't do this, do that sort of a approach. Jason Furman, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please mail suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Chess Pieces.